You've got a Bible there. Can you turn with me, please, to the book of Hebrews this morning? We're going to continue to look at this thing we've been talking about called faith. Started last week. We're going to spend a few weeks on the topic of, <coughs> excuse me, of faith. And um, last week we had a bit of a foundation. This week I want to dive a little bit and just slowly dip our waters and our toes into faith. Uh, again, now when I mention certain, so there are certain topics that kind of get people a bit cringy, isn't there, in church. There's certain words you shouldn't say, the F word, faith, that kind of gets, people have all these connotations of what faith means and what are you going to say. And you know, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, which we did a, a sort of series on uh, back end of last year, straight away certain people go, oh, Holy Spirit, I've been around some really weird stuff. This is going to get weird and so on. So I just want to encourage, if you're sitting there going, oh, faith, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt, the scars. Um, can I just encourage you, put your guard down, your defences down. We're going to make sure that what we talk about lines up with the word and we're just going to chip away bit by bit. And if you have major concerns or problems with some of the stuff that I'm talking about, grab a leader, grab somebody else, contact me. I don't mind. Uh, I'd rather that we, you know, if I can help you, uh, maybe something's not explained properly or unpacked enough for you, that's fine. Uh, come and have a chat with me. But uh, what, what I really feel on my heart is that I want us as a gathering, as a group of people, to kind of go on a journey together and look at this issue of faith, because there's something incredibly powerful about faith. In, 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 I think it's Mark chapter 6, is it, where Jesus goes back to, to Nazareth. I think it's Mark 6. And, and, and he talks about, he went back to his hometown. And it actually says that, that Jesus, and this is very rare, we don't see it anywhere else, Jesus could do no mighty works in his own hometown. That's amazing. The Son of God himself, who's, who's doing all kinds of things, went to his own hometown and Whatever the deal is, there's some kind of environment created there where he wanted to do something, but unbelief stopped him doing what was on his heart to do. And, and I think about the entire Christian life, and I wonder in my own world, God, there are things that you want to do in my world. And I can't escape the reality, whether I like it or not, it's another question. And the truth is, I don't. <laughs> I don't like those times where Jesus says to somebody, where's your faith? I would probably want to punch him in the nose and go, mind your own business. If you're so big, God, you can get around my... And he can. God can get around my unbelief, my lack of faith. But for some reason, faith seems to be this space where God and man cooperate together. And there seems to be this healthy expectation on the part of God that I step into this thing called faith. And that when I do, it just seems to be, from what I read in these ancient documents, that when I get in that faith, that space we call faith, it seems as if the things God wants to do become easier for him to do. And when I move towards unbelief, the things he wants to do become harder for him to do. It's not like faith is some kind of spiritual currency that can manipulate God to do that which he doesn't want to do. And I think some people think that faith, if I just get enough faith, I can get from God anything I want. But I don't see that in these ancient documents. I see, I see a God that wants to do amazing things. And I see when, I, can, when, I, when I, I step into this space that they call faith, when I step into that place, the things that he wants to do become easier for him to do in that space. When I step into unbelief, the things he wants to do seem to be withheld and it looks like it's a bit harder for him to get that stuff across the line. I don't get it. I don't understand it. But I'm just telling you, when I read these ancient documents, that's the impression and the picture that I get. And I'm sure deep down, just about everybody sitting here, you probably get that similar thing too. And it's uncomfortable sometimes too, especially for a, a bunch of Westerners who pride ourselves on being very intelligent and understanding everything about everything. We know how to put a man on the moon. We know how to put a, 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 an egg in a microwave, press a button, and boom, it's cooked and you can eat it in 30 seconds. We, we, we know how a, 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 a diesel engine works, don't we, Theo? We know that if this happens, we can trace it back. And we know all about anyone, computer people here. You know how to do all computer stuff. I'm not, but I'm sure there's computer type people here. And, and, and something breaks in a computer. You can look at it and go, yeah, trace it all back. We, we, just, we have so much knowledge about so many things, but when it comes to a, a lot of things to do with God, the reality is, that there's this, there's this gap there called faith. And I don't think God will ever give us enough information about him that we ever get to a point where we don't need faith to actually engage with him. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Not without faith, you're going to find it difficult. Without faith, you're going to find it a challenge. Without faith, it's impossible. So because God wants me to please him, I believe God makes sure that my life always has a faith space in it because that's where I'm pleasing to God. Sometimes, I think, sometimes we feel like faith is an event. I just need to get enough faith to get through this difficulty. And then when I come out the other end of that difficulty, what do we think happens with faith then? It's like faith is some kind of a currency. We build it up in the bank, we spend it, we get through the moment. And then what? Well, then we've got to build it up some currency again for the next moment. And sometimes I think that's how we view faith. 
But I read Hebrews 11, 6, and I go, no, no, no. If God, if I'm just focused on trying to get through this particular moment that I need faith to get through, thinking I just need to get through that over the other side so that I don't need faith for a while, God goes, that ain't how it works with me. Because those who are justified and made right in my sight, they will live their whole life by faith and trust in God. Amen? So faith's a really, really important thing. And I want to just have a look at a little, uh, just again, another one degree of faith this morning. And uh, for those of you that come here regularly, there'll probably be nothing new that you'll hear this morning. Because I've got, I, I believe everybody has a life message in them. I was meeting with a few people yesterday, we were talking about preaching and stuff. And I believe that every person in this room has at least one message in, in them. You may not be called to be a preacher or a teacher or whatever, but all of us, if we search and go back on our journey with God, everybody has at least one life message. It's not something you need to prepare. It's not something you study for. It's not something that came to you intellectually. It's something you look back at your life and you go, if there's one thing I know about how God works or what God does or how he sees me, there's something I've learned about God through the experience of my life. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is probably what I would say is my life message. This is the one thing that I believe I go back and look at my life. This is the one thread that consistently God puts before my face. And I want to share that with you today. Like I said, you probably heard bits and pieces because it comes out of who I am and probably comes across all the time. Hebrews 11, verse 1 to 3, it says this. It says, Now faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Some versions uh, will say uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There's, uh, faith is confidence here in the NIV. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for <coughs> and assurance about what we do not see. And then he goes on and begins to talk in Hebrews 11 about all these great people of faith in the past. He says, this is what the ancients were commended for. So when he talks about the ancients, Abraham, Moses, uh, Noah, Sarah, all these great men and women of God that we've read about in the Old Testament and we've cheered them on in their stories and we've been amazed at their faith. This is what he's talking about. He said, these guys were all commended by the same thing that we're going to be commended for going forward. It's the same thing. He says, this is what the ancients were commended for. By f-. And then he goes on and he says, the very first example he gives about faith, he says, now, now I'm going to explain to you a bit about faith and sort of what it looks like. He says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So faith is the confidence of what we hope for and the assurance of what we don't have. And the first example is about creation, that God said something, there was nothing, and then it appeared. And it's interesting that the very first example that he uses here of faith, the writer of Hebrews uses, I'm going too fast, aren't I, Leslie? I'll slow down. The very first example that the writer of Hebrews uses when he goes, okay, here's what faith is. Now I'm going to give you some examples. I'm not loud enough for you, am I, Theo? There's always somebody. Too fast, too soft, please. And the very first example he uses is actually about a moment in time where there was nothing and God commanded there was and then it happened. And interestingly enough, this all happened before there was a single human being around who saw it and had their faith built because they saw God do something. This is all by faith. It's all by faith. So one thing that's very clear here is that outcomes are not the foundation of our faith because faith exists before any outcomes are evident. That's what he's saying here. Faith and confidence comes before you're actually seeing any of that stuff. So, so faith is not something that some people think, I just need to see. If I see all this, then I will have faith. So what you're saying is the outcome happens first and then faith. Now, faith gets built on outcomes. We all know that. Because when God comes through and does something, it builds faith. It builds faith. But I know so many people that sit back and go, I'm not going to... Oh, we had a guy here for some years who was, 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 was kind of interested in God. And, and he used to come here every Sunday. And I remember having a conversation with him one day. And he said this to me. <laughs> he said, I want God to do some kind of miracle for me like he does for other people. And then I'll come to him. I thought, well, that happens sometimes for some of us. I'm not saying it doesn't. Don't ever put God in a box and say that what you believe is formulated. Go through the Bible. There's no formulas. Matthew 4.19 is the only formula, I think, that you'll find that you can, you can rock solid, lock in. Jesus, he called the disciples to be with him. Uh, and and when, they, when they came to him, uh, it says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. There's a principle. You focus on following God, he'll focus on making you into what you're meant to be. Amen? Simple principle, very, very good one. But outside of that, you know, there's not many things there that you can go, here, God's just given us a, a, a book that gives us a whole bunch of formulas. And I know that that might tread on some toes. And I'm sorry if you've got a book at home that says The Five Ways to Divine Healing. 
I don't know that that's 100% perfectly accurate all the time. Or seven ways to divine prosperity and three steps to this. There are principles in the word of God, but to lock it in and say these formulas work. And I've seen so many people's faith shipwrecked because they were told this is how it works. They did the five steps, didn't get healed. God doesn't love me. God doesn't like me. What's wrong with me? And so on. When we lived in YWAM many, many years ago, anyone ever heard of a method of um, contraception called the Billings method? You ever heard of the Billings method? Yeah. Two people have. Anyone else? No? The Billings method, oh, a few more people. It's a method of contraception where it's basically temperature and you work out your temperature. Is that, that's how it is, isn't it? And when you're at a certain temperature, it's okay for hubby and wife to, to um, go off. And, and when it's... <laughs> All of a sudden, I realised, hang on, who's here? Where am I? And there are other times where they don't go off together alone. That makes sense? And apparently, if you time it right with the temperature, we were told it was foolproof. Well, all the mothers on the Wyworth base at the time were living, and this was their method of contraception, was the Billings method. You know what? So many of them got pregnant that it actually became a joke on the base. What do you call a woman on the Billings method? Mum. That's, it just didn't work. But you know what was interesting? Everybody on the method defended the method. They always put blame on themselves. No, no, the method's foolproof. I must have done this wrong, or I must have done that wrong. I must have... And it's like, no, 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 maybe, heaven forbid, maybe the method is not foolproof, you know? And sometimes I think with some of these five ways and three guaranteed steps, sometimes I, I, I feel like, you know, don't kick yourself because you followed the, 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 the formula and it didn't work. Don't kick yourself. It's not always your, you. It's not always, you're not always the problem. Maybe the formula wasn't foolproof. Maybe it wasn't perfect. Maybe there were some other things in there. Maybe God's not in heaven going, I'm going to give you a rule book and some formulas and then you can just do the right thing and it'll just happen. Maybe God's going, uh, I've got an intimate relationship with you and I want you to come to me and your process may be different to your process, may be different to your process, may be different to your process because I see a big picture and you don't. And then maybe, maybe that's, that's kind of how it, <coughs> how it works. But, but coming back to the verse, Hebrews 11, one thing that's very clear is that outcomes are not the foundation of our faith. They can build faith, but found, outcomes are not the starting point for faith. Somehow it seems to me that faith comes and it's possible to have faith and faith can exist before we get to the point of outcomes in our life. Now, now let me just very quickly explain this because I know we've got some people here that are you know, raving Jesus freaky people and then we've got some people who are... Who are not there yet, you're still working it all out, so we're all across the board. But I just want to say this, that faith, when I say the word faith, faith is not something that is exclusive to Christianity. Okay? And I'll go a step further, faith is not something that is exclusive to religion. Did you know that? Faith is something that is exclusive to human existence, period. How many of you, when you got out of bed this morning, right? How many of you, when you got out of bed this morning, had wheat bix or cornflakes or something like that? Anybody? Some sort of thing where you poured some milk on a... On a, a um, yep, Leslie did. Or, or <laughs> some people might have had some toast. You put some bread in, uh, in, in a toaster and so on. Uh, how many of you had a, <coughs> had a coffee this morning? You made a coffee or a tea or something like that? Yep. Now, now let, me, let me take a, a, an example of someone that might have got up this morning and had wheat bix. Here's what I know you would have done. Here's the process of your morning. You would have got up this morning. You would have gone to the cupboard, opened up the cupboard, pulled out the wheat bix. You would not have taken each individual wheat bix out, put it under a microscope, examined it, make sure there were no amoebas or there was no bugs or anything in there. You wouldn't have gone back to the ingredients and checked it all out and then balanced it out and made sure, broke it down. Is that telling me the truth? Can I trust sanitarium? Can I have faith in sanitarium to eat this particular wheat bix? And then you did it with the second and the third and the fourth and however many you had. Then you went and got the pasteurized milk out of the cupboard, uh, fridge, sorry. And before you poured the milk on your cereal, you did the same thing. You put it in a little cup, held it under a Bunsen burner, did some tests, examinations, made sure the milk is exactly how they said it was and fit for human consumption. And then you put it on. And then uh, with your toaster, you put your toast down. And then before you put the toast down, you called Ben uh, Luca Electrical, said, come and do an electrical check on the thing. I want to make sure it's not going to blow up and set my kitchen on fire when I pressed the pop-up button down and, and Ben came over and did his test. You didn't do any of that, did you? You just opened up the box, poured the milk, popped the bread in, pushed the thing down, grabbed the Vegemite, whatever. You did not do that. So you started your day by faith. You've already lived by faith. 
just making your breakfast. Then you got in a car and you jumped in that car and you drove down the road. And you, you put your faith in that vehicle's ability to get you from A to B. You put faith in the petrol company that put the fuel in your car, that it wasn't going to break up. You, you got here, uh, you jumped out, you walked in. Now, here's a funny thing. I didn't see a single person when they walked into this building this morning go, let me just have a check. Let me just make sure. What's the rating on that? Yeah. Just, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, that'll work. And then you sat down on the chair. You just popped your bottom down. Didn't you? You did no testing, no checking. You just sat down by faith. You just trusted and believed that that thing was going to hold your body. You had confidence in a whole bunch of things this morning. You didn't even realise it. Well, you've started your day by faith. You live today by faith already. So faith is not something that is exclusive to religion. Sometimes we talk about faith. You know, I talk about, about people that are not uh, religious, not Christians. And they'll say, yeah, but you have faith. I'll say, yeah, but you do too. No, I don't. Well, and I'll go through a process like that. Go say, so you don't have faith. You trusted Ampol for your fuel. You trusted, what's the milk company? Norco for your milk. You trusted, you trusted, you trusted. How many of you, your wife handed you a cup of coffee this morning, you drank it without asking a question? <laughs> hey, Rod knows where I'm going. <laughs> hey? If he has lucky, Delma's not here. They're all confident when they're alone, aren't they? Oh, right next to you. So that's faith. How many of you go to work? How many of you go to work and you work all week and your boss pays you at the end of the week? Who does that? Yeah? So you're going to work every day in faith, trust and confidence that in seven days he's going to plop a few dollars in my bank account, don't you? And and, and so you're doing something without the evidence, without the outcome, but you're doing it in faith. So the point is this, that, that faith is not a difficult thing to live by. It's actually quite simple. We all do it all the time. So faith is not something that is just a part of your religious world. You live by faith all day, every day. And if you don't, then you'd be stressed out of your head, wouldn't you? You'd be a basket case if you didn't choose to live by faith every day. But we do it so naturally, guess what we don't even notice? And you know, I think that's what faith is. If you go back and you read in Hebrews chapter 4, where the writer of Hebrews is talking about faith, and he, he puts these words together, he, he, he says that, that faith is like a place of rest. He talks about the rest of faith. For some people, faith is like a mad striving, trying to whip something up into a frenzy and make... But, but he says in Hebrews that, that faith is a kind of place of rest. Now, some of you were here last week and you heard my heartbreaking confession that I forgot to pick my daughter up from school. Do you remember that story? Of course you would, because it was all something I did wrong and no one ever forgets that. Anyway, got that out, now move on. So you know what? Here's what happened. I forgot to pick her up, forgot to organise it and so on. Right? But you know what? Here's the thing. Even though she didn't get picked up in the time frame she thought, it didn't happen in her time frame, she wasn't stressed and freaking out. Even though it didn't happen the way she thought, she thought that she'd be picked up and taken home. She ended up being picked up by Sarah, taken back to Sarah's place, and then mum picked her up. Like, even though everything didn't happen the way that she thought or planned in her timing or in her way, there was a confidence in her. Because she trusts her parents. She knew it was going to happen. Didn't happen my way, didn't happen my timing, but I trust them. I trust them. And, and, and faith is this place of quite confident rest that we can have in our life. Now, if faith is actually exercised by everyone, then what makes the different faiths different? And the answer is simple. It's the foundation upon which that faith sits or upon which that faith rests. Hebrews 11.11, going on further in Hebrews, says this, speaking of Sarah. It says, And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because... Watch this. She considered him faithful who had made the promise. Not had brought the promise to pass. This is before she ever gave birth to a child. It says that she was able to do it. It says she considered him faithful. A person who hadn't, a God who hadn't sort of come through, it hadn't happened yet, but she had determined and decided that he was faithful. Romans chapter 4, verse 20 and 21, speaking of Abraham, Abram says this. It says that he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. This is an old man. You're going to be father of many nations. It says he didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. 
being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. So it hasn't happened yet, but here's Abram. Now, how is it possible? Put those two verses together, Abram and Sarah. How is it possible? Their faith was strengthened. They gave glory to God. They were fully persuaded that God had the power to do whatever he said. And they considered God faithful before anything had ever been done or come to pass. Before any outcome had been seen, they're glorifying God. They consider him faithful. It's like God didn't have to prove himself to them. But they had discovered something or had lent on something that told them God could be trusted, that told them we can give glory to God now. We don't have to wait until the thing happens. We're fully persuaded that God's got the power to do it, if he chooses to. And we know that God, by character and nature, is faithful and good. And the answer is very simple. It's because the foundation of their faith rested in the character and the nature of the one who made the promise. Have you ever heard a saying that a man's, only, a man's words only as good as his character? You ever heard that? Yeah? I've heard lots and lots of things from people throughout my life, and so have you. But if a person's character is untrustworthy, then you hold their words like that, don't you? You don't get too excited about it. I remember growing up as a child, and I love my, my, I love my dad. We've got a great relationship. No disrespect to him. He's got his story and his background. But one consistent thing in my life growing up was, hey, this is going to happen, here's a promise, and then it wouldn't happen. We're going to go here and do this, and then we wouldn't. You're going to have this, and then you wouldn't. So I grew up holding everything like that and not really trusting anything that was said. Why did I not trust what was said? Because I didn't trust the character of the person who said it. I didn't trust the nature of the person who said it. But if you trust the character and and the nature of the person who said it, it's a totally different ballgame. So the foundation of their faith was not in the outcomes because they hadn't had outcomes yet. But they knew something about God. They knew that God by nature is not a liar. God by nature and character is trustworthy. God is faithful. God, the God that we follow, is good. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you consider God faithful? Do you consider God faithful? Do you trust in the character and the nature of God? Does your faith in who God is sustain you when God's not doing what you think he should? You ever have those moments? Well, if I was God, I'd just heal that person. And for whatever reason, God didn't. Well, if I was God, I'd fix that problem. If I was God, I'd fix that person. If I was God, I'd... If I was God, if I was God, particularly in our own world... Well, Lord, why won't you? I mean, you should be. I mean, I'm good. I'm, no. Why aren't you doing this, God? Why aren't you coming through for me, God? Does your faith in who God is sustain you when God's not doing what you think he should? See, faith for the Christians could be defined as this, a conviction of the truthfulness of God. That's what biblical faith is. It's a conviction of the truthfulness of God. Regardless of an outcome, regardless of an end game, God is always good. I don't judge God by the outcome. I look at the outcome in light of who God is. And I go, the outcome is good because God is good. Even if it's not the outcome I wanted. But because God is good and faithful and trustworthy, then the outcome is secondary. And if God gives me what I want, praise God, I love those... Who loves it when they get what they want from God? (laughs) You bunch of lies. You all love it when you get what you want from God. Hey? You love it when you get what you want from God. But when we don't, eh, there's that wrestle, isn't there? There's that tension. There's all that disappointment. And then sometimes, like the Billings Method, we start questioning and, oh, it must be me and maybe I don't have faith and maybe I this, maybe I that. But our faith needs to rest in the character and nature of God, not in the outworkings of God or the things that happen as a result of that. Um, God had power. God was faithful before anything ever happened. Further on in Hebrews 11:13. It says this, all these people were still living by faith when they died. All these people living by faith when they died. Isn't it a shame when you know a believer, someone that follows Jesus, and before they fall off the perch, they ditch their faith because somebody disappointed them, because they didn't get what the formula suggested, because somebody somebody told them this would guarantee you this will happen, and it didn't. And they ditch their faith, and they fall away from God. And it breaks my heart when I see people like that. 
You had a, a fire and a passion for God, but because you didn't get the outcome. So your faith, you were more impressed with what God did than you were with who God was. Don't ever be more impressed with what God does than who God is. Who God is will never change. What God does will change. Because in his divine wisdom, he gets it. I don't. If I was God, I'd just do everything. So I'd be like, anyone ever see that? What was that movie with Jim Carrey? Remember that Jim Carrey film where Bruce Almighty. Yeah, of course you'd remember Bruce. <laughs> Bruce anyone ever seen the movie Bruce Almighty? If you haven't, you should. It's actually a really good movie. And God basically comes to Bruce and says to Bruce, you can have my job because Bruce is whinging about God not, getting, not you know, doing his job. And so one day God, Morgan Freeman, comes to him and says, well, you can have my job. I'm going on a week's sabbatical. And he disappears. All of a sudden, Jim Carrey, can you imagine the world? With Jim Carrey is God. I mean, that is frightening in itself. Jim Carrey becomes God. He's got all these prayers going on and, and he's, he's answering them on the computer. Remember, he sets up a Yahoo thing on the computer. And so in the end, he just can't keep up with them. So he just hits... Um, the word yes and send. And every single prayer and every person in the world gets the answer yes to everything. And all of a sudden there's riots in the streets and the, you know, the stock markets crash and a tsunami comes to... You know, it just goes ballistic and chaos. I'm so glad that I don't have to have all those big picture answers and that God in heaven and his wisdom and his knowledge and his understanding, he deals with that stuff. I'm so glad. So I would rather be the one trusting and listening and letting him make up the decisions than the one who supersedes him and says, no, this is how you've got to do it. I'd rather learn to trust God. And I think that's what faith is. It's having faith and trust in the character and the nature of God, even when we're not getting what, we're, what we think we should get. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They didn't even get it. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. Imagine that. Imagine a promise from God and having to live your whole life trusting God, even though you're not going to get it, even though it doesn't come to pass. And as the days tick by, you don't get weaker and weaker and weaker in faith. It says they got stronger. They gave glory to God. They believed God. They trusted God. They didn't judge God and criticize God. They didn't allow their faith to be like the faith of the, uh, the, 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 the Jewish nation in the Old Testament. You know the stories? <laughs> We love God. Yeah, God is for us. Woo! Yay! And then all of a sudden, God doesn't do what they think that he should do. And so they turn their back on God. They chase other gods and so on. Uh, the, the journey in the, in the wilderness, Israel coming out of Egypt, and they're whinging, grumbling, complaining. Every second chapter, every second verse, they're whinging about something. And then all of a sudden, they're loving God because he gives them water. Then they don't have this, and they whinge. And then they give them, and they love him. And then they don't get this, and they're whinging. And then they get that, and they're loving. And they're like James, sort of tossed to and fro with every thought and mentality about God because they just haven't settled the issue. Regardless of what outcomes happen, look what he did. He is good. He is faithful. He is worth trusting. But so many people put their faith in the activities of God and the actions of God and not the character and nature of God. And that's why so many people end up shipwrecked in their faith because the character and nature of God will never change. His actions and activities from time to time will. I don't get it. You don't get it. And he doesn't feel the need to tell me all of the time. But sometimes God does things different than I would. But I'm comfortable with that because I always fall back on the character and nature of God. Even though this was the outcome, I know this. God by nature is good good and trustworthy and faithful and loving and caring and nothing that he has done is outside the boundaries and nature or motivation of his character and how he sees me and how he feels about me and I settle that as the foundation of my faith before I move on anywhere else in life if you were to plot your faith on a graph what would it look like what would your faith look like on a graph I've got, I've got Russell sitting there going Some of us would like to be the heartbeat monitors on movies. Bing! Bing! He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. I got faith? No, I don't. I got faith? No, I don't. I got faith? No, I don't. He's listening? No, he's not. He's listening to me? No, he's not. He cares for me? No, he doesn't. Boop, 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 boop. And we wonder why we never go on to more maturity in our faith, why we never get to a point where those issues are settled and we can move forward into all that God has for us. And I do think, biblically, there's an expectation that when it comes to our faith that we would mature a little bit and that we would grow up a little bit and begin to move into something a bit more meaty than just, he loves me, he loves me, and he listens to me, he doesn't listen to me, he cares for me, he doesn't care for me. I think God wants a little bit more from us for that. I'll finish with this. The reason this is my life message is very simple. 
19 years of age, I become a Christian. I go off to an organisation called Youth with a Mission. I get saved. Six months later, I'm in YWAM. And I loved it there. I'm doing, a, you know, God's just pouring out his love on me and showing me that he loves me and it's awesome time and I'm learning all these things about God. About roughly two years into my time there, I join a training school. The training school is called a School of Evangelism. It's a secondary um, level school. It's another six months, three months of lectures and three months of outreach. Although when I went on outreach, I bought a one-way ticket to India because I decided I was never going to come back to Australia. I thought, God, you told me to go to India. You never told me to come back. So in my simple faith, I bought a one-way ticket, so I'm just going to go. And honestly, I thought to this day I would still be there. And honestly, I'd still love to be over there. It's the most wonderful nation with the most wonderful people. I, I love the place. But what ended up happening was um, during my SOE, these amazing things started happening. It was a really wild and unique time where the Holy Spirit turned up and just blew everybody's mind. Everybody. It didn't matter who it was. And it didn't matter. Each week we'd have different speakers come through. And it didn't matter who the speaker was. Every week we, had, we only had one lecture room on the base at the time and Jackie was actually doing her DTS, the discipleship training school. So we had a tent outside. When it would rain, the water would go and it was all muddy and that, but it didn't matter. We went out in the tent every day and had our lectures. Every week we were seeing physical healings. Every week we were seeing demonic deliverances, people being set free of, of, of spiritual things on their life. Every, every week. It didn't matter who the speaker was, whether they were good, bad or indifferent. didn't matter. God was almost like, I don't really care who stands up there. I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. I saw some of the most amazing people get set free of emotional baggage. And, and, and for me, 19 years of age getting saved, my only experience of God was I, I went and sat in um, Bowling Uniting Church for a few months before I went to YWAM. So that's my experience of church um, and, and loved it. Fantastic people, but I wouldn't have seen anything like that going on on, on on a Sunday morning. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing all these wild, amazing things. It was freaking me out. But at the same time, I'm going, yeah, but that person was, was, was all messed up and uptight and stuff, and I've known them for a long time, and all of a sudden they get up off the ground and they're totally set free. It was about fruit, manifestations, never getting pressed with manifestations. But the fruit in their life was amazing. People had joy, and they were, they were able to forgive family members that, that, that they weren't able to forgive before. All these amazing things, people being, as I said, physically healed and so on. Well, on the back of that, I jump on a plane and go over to India, don't I? And I'm in India, and what was happening in the tent continued on. Me and an American mate of mine called Justin, we would go out into the slums of India, and we would preach the gospel, uh, and we'd have an interpreter, they would interpret. And then at the end of it, we would always say, you don't have to believe in Jesus, because I tell you, he's big enough to reveal himself to you. Can we pray for you? And people would come forward, and we'd be praying. <coughs> And we saw all kinds of miracles, eyes, people that couldn't see all of a sudden were seeing, people that couldn't walk all of a sudden getting up off the ground. All these things that in my little theological pea brain box didn't make sense. But I'm looking at it going, well, that kind of happened when Jesus was around and people are uh, coming to faith and so on. And so the fruit of it's pretty good. And we were seeing all these amazing miracles. One day, me and my friend Justin, we were sitting down on our little balcony. We had this little uh, unit, little two-room unit that we lived in. And our back balcony was about as, as, as big as this curved part of the stair. And in the morning, we'd have our quiet times and we'd go and meet there with a coffee. And we'd stand and we had a paddock at the back of our house. And that was where all the men, as the sun came up, would grab their little pail of water, go and walk into the middle of the paddock and do what men do in the middle of a paddock in India. And so they would, we'd sit there and we'd have our coffee. And we'd chat. And we'd be so excited about God. And we would talk about everything God was showing us in his word. And what we felt like God was saying to us. And it was just one of the most beautiful times uh, of my life and one of the greatest spiritual friendships. Uh, if you don't have somebody that you can talk and just talk about what God is doing, what God is saying in your life, can I encourage you? Find somebody. It's really, really exciting. And so one day we had a moment of sobriety. And we said to each other, you know what? This is actually amazing what's going on. But we're only, what, I think by that stage, 20, 21. What if all this stuff that's going on, what if our character isn't big enough to handle it? What if one day we get really proud and arrogant and think we're something special? Because that only seemed to be happening with us, not the whole team. <laughs> and we had this real moment where we actually went inside, got down on our knees, and we both prayed together, Lord, if you can see down the track that our character, that you know, we could get proud and arrogant about this and I mean, God, relationship with you is more important than all the stuff going on. So, God, if that's the case, would you? we're asking you to stop. Use someone else. Don't use us. And it was a genuine, genuine heartfelt prayer. We got up from that prayer, washed up, went out, went to a slum, preached. Lady came forward for prayer, walking like this. She said, come up, we're going to pray for you. We prayed for her. When we finished praying, we said, can you stand up? She went, no. 
Oh, we'll pray again, because Jesus prayed again. One time he prayed for a guy's eyes, couldn't see, and then he said, I see men like trees walking, so I prayed a second time. So I said, we'll pray again. So we prayed again. Then we said to her, can you stand up? And she went, nah. And so we just went, well, that's okay. You just go and just believe in faith that God's going to heal you, and, you know, we believe. And Next, one after one, people came up and we prayed. Not a thing happened. And that continued on for a number of months after that. To be honest with you, I've never gone back to that place where I felt like King, King Midas and everything I touched turned to gold. I've never been taken back to that moment again, ever since that we prayed that prayer. But something happened inside of me. <laughs> I used to go downtown on my motorbike. I had this motorbike and I'd go downtown and there was these kids in this slum area. They would come and they would polish my bike and guard my bike like guard dogs. And I would you know, give them a few rupees and that. Then I found out that their father took the money bought alcohol with it. So I stopped giving them money and what I started doing was I'd buy them sandals and shoes. Then I found out their dad would steal the sh- sandals, sell it and drink it. So I had this little system with them and they knew how it worked. They'd hear my bike come into town, all the kids would run, polish, they'd guard it and when I finished my shopping we'd all go to a little ice cream shop and we would sit on the stairs together, a whole bunch of us, and I'd buy every one of them an ice cream and I'd sit there and it was one of the biggest joys in my heart to watch these kids be kids. They were just being kids eating ice cream, making fun of me because I couldn't understand their language and we'd laugh and have a good time. I'd go home, come back the next day. Same thing, it was this ritual. One day I'm sitting down on the stairs having an ice cream with them and I'm looking at them. This is after I prayed this prayer and after all, this, all these activities stopped, all these miracles stopped. And I'm looking at them and suddenly this thought goes in my head. God, those kids didn't ask to be born in India to a drunken family. They didn't ask to be in this situation. Maybe you're not as good as I think you are. God, maybe you're not as faithful as what I think you are. Maybe you're not as great as what I'm telling people that you are. And it started with a thought. And that little thought germinated and that seed began to grow and to grow and to grow. To cut a long story short, about three months later, I jumped on a bus from central India, a three-day bus ride up through India all the way to Nepal. I got out in Nepal to do a visa run. Every six months, we'd have to do a visa run. The other three team members that travelled up with me said, we're going to the embassy, you're coming. I said, no, no, uh, you guys go, I'll sort mine out later on. As soon as they left, I went to a travel agent, booked a plane ticket and flew back to Australia. I didn't tell my leaders, I didn't tell the guys I worked with, my best mate Justin at the time, that we shared this spiritual journey. I didn't even tell him. I just disappeared. Got out of the plane in Brisbane, called up a friend from school, he picked me up and ended up back in Ballina, which is the place where I was, where I gave my life to the Lord. On the way home on the plane, I stopped at Bangkok Airport and what I did is I got out, uh, went to the music shop in Bangkok Airport and I used to have a Walkman. Anyone remember what a Walkman was? Yeah, some of you remember a Walkman. A little cassette. Remember what a cassette was? <laughs> you used to have a cassette and you'd put it in and clip it on with the batteries and your big foam earplug things. Bangkok Airport, I went to the music store and I bought every album, every cassette I could think of that I knew God would hate. I'd look at the bands and go, I know that you sing against God, I'll buy that and I'll buy that, I'll buy that. And here I am, I'm a missionary, I'm ministering to people and so on, and here's the moment I hit in my life. I get out, I end up here in Ballina, and I spent two whole days walking up and down, about a week, sorry, it was a week, walking up and down, there's River Street and there's a laneway behind it that runs through. I walked up and down that laneway with this music on, about eight hours a day, every day, just walked up and down with this music on. And as I'm walking along, I'm I'm walking and I'm just trying to, to, to hate God, that's what I was trying to do, I wanted to hate God. And I knew where Jesus was. Don't ask me how to describe it to you, I can't. It's just a weird feeling. I knew he was about three steps behind me, about one step off to the left, and he walked with me. And I would get so frustrated, I would stop. And when I stopped, don't ask me how I know, I just know. He would stop and he would fold his hands and stand there. I can't explain to you how I know that. I can't explain it, but I know it. And I would, must have looked like a madman, because I would stand there with my headphones on and I would call out, Leave me alone! I hate you! You're not good! And I'd start abusing God. And anyone looking at me must have literally thought, this guy is crazy, he lost his marbles. But I, was, I believed I was talking to Jesus, who was three steps behind and one off to the left. This went on for about a week. Finally, a mate of mine heard about it from Brisbane. Got in touch with my sister, tracked me down. Said, can I come on down to Ballina and have a chat with you? Long story short, I ended up saying, yeah, no worries. He came down. We sat on a jetty on the edge of the Richmond River and he began to talk to me and I began to talk. And I just cracked and I started bawling. I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Because you know what it's like when you have faith in God. You can't, it's really hard to lose faith in God. It's like someone saying to me, the sun won't come up tomorrow. I've just had too much experience with it. And I know it will. Even if I don't want it to. Even if I hate the thought of it. 
It's the same thing with God. Even though I hated the thought of God and didn't like him, and deep down inside, I just knew he was there. I can't deny the reality of, of God in my life and in the world. I can't do it. And I cracked and I started bawling. And I told him the story. I said, how can God be good when this is going on and that's going on? And all, and, and all this stuff came out of me about the character and the nature of God. That's what it was. And he finished with me and he prayed for me. And he got up and he left. And as he left, I sat on that jetty by myself. And the Holy Spirit impressed a verse on my heart. And I'll finish with this. Psalm 103, verse 7. Speaking of Moses and, and the Israelites and the journey they had as they came out of the wilderness. That journey of we love God when he's doing everything we want. And then when he's not, we hate God and we want to find other gods. And then we love God when he's doing what we want and we hate him when we don't. And our faith's high and we'll glorify God when he's doing what we want, but we won't worship him and sing to him or nothing when he's not doing what we don't want. That was the journey of Israel. And in Psalm 103 verse 7 it says this. It says, He made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. Some versions say he made known his ways to Moses and his actions to the people of Israel. And the Holy Spirit in that moment said to me, Alan, you know that time where you were seeing everything and you felt like King Midas and all that stuff? He said, you know what happened? You put your faith in the actions of God. And all of a sudden, when God wasn't doing the same actions and doing what you thought he would, your faith crumbled and collapsed, just like the Israelites did. Moses was different. He didn't have his faith in the actions of God. He understood the ways of God. He understood the character of our God, the nature of our God. And if you want to build a strong faith life, and if you want a foundation to stand upon, even as we go through this journey of faith and we look more and more at it, the starting point is this. Do you believe that God is good, faithful, just, holy, trustworthy? Because if you don't settle that issue, you will forever have a faith life that looks like the stock market. Up, down, up, down, up, down. And so many people sitting in churches this morning love God when he's doing what they want and have no time for God when he's not. And it's such a terrible way to live. <laughs> Pick a side. But I want to say this. My experience and my testimony is this. If you put your faith and trust in the character and nature of God, his actions will change. But his character and nature never will. And if I'm rooted and grounded and connected to the character and nature of God, then it doesn't matter what the action is. I'll know that it came from a God who's good, who's faithful who's trustworthy. Why did that person get healed and that person go on and die when I prayed for them? I don't know. But I know this. The same God that was involved in both those prayers was good, trustworthy, faithful, honourable, and worthy of my loyalty. Amen? Thank you.